the news agents. The big question for the election and what happens after the election is really this. In what way will Labour be different to the Conservatives? In lots of ways, right now, it doesn't feel like they would be very different at all. They've basically agreed to match Conservative plans on spending, on taxes, on their tax cuts. And so that leaves Labour with a big, big problem. If it intends to do anything, even little things, how do they pay for it? So today, Labour's Chancellor tried to end those questions about this big black hole in Labour's spending plans after the Chancellor essentially nicked their plans about non-DOMs in last month's budget. She's pledged more money to, checks notes, close tax loopholes. Is that as ambitious as it's going to get? Welcome to the News Agents. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And just to remind you how Labour got here, they had a policy which they've had in various forms for years under Miliband, under Corbyn, under Starmer, to eliminate or substantially change the non-DOM tax regime. This relates to a small group of people who are not domiciled in the UK for tax purposes. They tend to be very wealthy. One of them actually included, until recently, the Prime Minister's Rishi Sunak's wife. That was supposed to raise a few billion pounds that Labour were going to use to spend on some quite modest measures, including things like preschool breakfast clubs, on new dental appointments in the NHS, on new Saturday appointments for the NHS as well. Problem was, Jeremy Hunt, in the last budget, came along and stole the policy and spent it on tax cuts instead, which left Labour with a black hole. So they've been kind of scratching their head for the last few weeks, happy gratified that the Tories have sort of stolen their ideas, but now needing to find more money after Hunt used the money that they would have raised to help cut national insurance in last month's budget. Today, we got the first attempt at an answer, and it's this, that Labour thinks it can raise £5 billion a year by the end of the next Parliament by hiring the kind of compliance officers that could weed out people who are dodging their tax. The party has said it will invest some £550 million a year, upfront costs, but they think they could recover £2 billion to boost NHS spending and the breakfast clubs that you have talked about. I guess the question is, is the money there from closing loopholes? Every government we've ever heard of has tried to close loopholes. Every government. Every literally. government. And is it ambitious enough for a party that says it wants transformational change of Britain? Well, we're joined now by the Shadow Health Secretary, uh, Wes Streeting. Uh, Wes, thanks so much for coming back. I'm on the show. And we're going to talk a little bit about the NHS, which is, of course, your area. But obviously, big Labour announcement today, talking about how you intend to plug that hole that the Conservatives created when they themselves stole your policy to change the non-DOM tax regime. I mean, you've basically come back saying you're going to fill it, at least in part, by clamping down on tax avoidance. I mean, don't you think that that has rather occurred to every other government before? I mean, is that really the best that you've made of it over the last few weeks and months? Well, this government has an abysmal record on tax avoidance, and we've seen the tax gap now stand at about £36 billion a year. This is the money that's owed to HMRC but for all sorts of reasons, not least a lack of of resource on HMRC's part, they don't collect. So what Rachel Reeves has done is take that 36 billion pound tax gap and using National National Audit Office figures, she's estimated that she can raise a small C conservative five billion pounds. And if it's a choice between clamping down on tax avoidance uh, or Um, allowing our NHS waiting list to grow, I'd rather clamp down on tax avoidance. If it's a choice between letting kids go hungry uh, at primary school because they've arrived at school without breakfast and the families are struggling a cost of living crisis, I'd much rather that we clamp down on tax avoidance so that kids start the day with hungry minds, not hungry bellies. Let's imagine, imagine, given that you're obviously so passionate about avoiding all of those things, which most people I'm sure would agree are very bad things, um, would you rather if you can't raise the money from tax avoidance because lots of governments as we've said have come along before and said we're going to clamp down on tax avoidance and then the receipts don't come into hmrc for all sorts of reasons what happens then 
because you've boxed yourself in so profoundly in so many ways. You've refused to countenance any increases in the main tax levers, whether it's income tax or national insurance or whatever it is. You've refused to countenance the idea of reversing some of the tax cuts that the Conservatives come along have come along with. So what do you do then if you can't raise this money? Do you abandon those policies that you've just outlined? Well, firstly, Rachel has been characteristically prudent in her approach. So despite the fact the tax gap stands at 36 billion, she's not said, well, I'm going to raise that 36 billion and spend it on public services or give it away in tax cuts. She says, I'm going to raise 5 billion using estimates provided by the National Audit Office so that, you know, if she's able to raise more, great. But, but what if she doesn't gone, raise enough? What happens then? For us? Well, look, we, we heard these arguments with the non-DOM status, Lewis. And Where's... so I'm not worried at all about whether Ray, Rachel can raise this amount of money. It may be that the magpies and the Tories nick it in the autumn. And if they do, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But as everyone knows, Rachel Rees is famously a chess player. She's always thinking a few moves ahead. Wes, I want to go back to your question to us, if it's a choice between hungry kids or tax avoidance. The point is it's not. It's only that choice in your head. And I guess the question is, more more bluntly, where is the ambition? Like, where is the, where is the 1945, you know, Attlee ambition, beverage ambition, Bevan ambition, realising that we are at, you have told us we are at, a moment of transformational change. And Labour doesn't seem willing... To, to go there. We're dealing with the reality of 14 years of Conservative government. They were dealing with the reality just... of the Second World War. And if you're serious about delivering the kind of change our country needs and delivering the decade of national renewal that Keir Starmer's talking about, that starts with credible economic policies and credible fiscal policies. And if you're, if you're trying to win a mandate for change, that also means reassuring a deeply sceptical and cynical public who frankly given up on a lot of politics and politicians, that the promises that you make are promises you can keep. Well, it's and only, we it's seen... only credible if you say that everything else is not credible. If you think that actually changing the terms of public spending is not credible. I mean, Attlee could have said that in 1945. They could have said, oh, we don't want to risk this. You're being dictated to here by what the Tories have told you is sort of legit, what the... I guess the right wing press have told you is OK to spend. You, you could be making very different choices at this point and people could be following Labour because they thought you were going to be transformational with public spending. Well, look, if people simply thought that governments could just splash the cash and solve all of the problems, we, then frankly, people had that choice available at the last general election. And one of the many albatrosses around Labour's neck at the 2019 general election was a belief that the manifesto was too good to be true, that we were promising too much too soon, too much for too many, and a manifesto that, that st stretched the boundaries of credibility to breaking point. And that was one of a number of reasons why Labour lost that general election. And then we're also learning from more recent history about what happens when you have an ideologically driven prime minister and chancellor who decide that they know best, screw everyone else, you know, the Bank of England, the Office for Budget Responsibility, businesses and investors, we're just going to roll the dice with our ideological hobby horses and, you know, cut taxes and again, splash the cash. People are still paying the price for that kind of recklessness. And Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer are not going to make the same mistake of either far-fetched promises that can't be delivered or unfunded spending commitments, whether that's public spending or tax cuts, because look where that has got us. Party Kwarteng might have moved on. Liz Trust shamelessly continues as if nothing's happened and nothing's changed. But there are people in our country today who are paying hundreds of pounds more a month, either in higher mortgages or higher rents and higher bills. Not because of public because spending of investment, though. That's not why they're doing it. They're paying it because of reckless bad decisions, not because the government of the day decided to invest more money in public spending. And Labour's made some big commitments on investment already in terms of our public services. And crucially, we've got an approach that says government and business and civil society need to pull together to achieve our, our missions, whether that's getting growth back into the economy. Because if the economy had grown uh, under this government, at the same extent that it grew under the last Labour government, there'd be tens of billions of pounds more to spend on our public services. But because they've choked off growth and because we've had low growth and 
high inflation and high interest rates, we're in an absolute mess. So Labour's going to have to work the country out of that mess. And I just ask people to give change a chance at the next general election and trust in a team that has thought very carefully about the promises we make to make sure they're promises we can keep and to make sure that in four or five years time, we're coming back to the country to say, not only did we deliver our promises, we were able to deliver a bit more rather than come back in four or five years time and say, really sorry folks, but we promised too much and we've delivered too little. Well, it's talking about pandering to the right wing press. You had a uh, interview, you had an article, I should say, in The Sun yesterday, where you talked about saying we will use spare capacity in the private sector to cut the waiting list. Middle class lefties cry betrayal. Why use language like that? Who are these well, middle class lefties? You can have a cursory glance at my social media mentions to understand why. Look, I think there is um, a terrible two tier system we have in our country at the moment where those who can afford it are paying to go private and those who can't are being left behind. And I think there is, I think, both a pragmatic and principled case for using spare private sector capacity. Yeah, sure, bring... that's fine. That's fine. That's, that's a perfectly past. legitimate argument. But why use language like that? I mean, there, there'll be plenty of MPs in your own party who do not approve of the idea of using private capacity into bringing that into the NHS. Are they middle class lefties? I think you've got to ask this question, actually. No, no, I'm is... asking the question I'm asking. There have been plenty, no, I, what, there have what, been what plenty of to, MPs. What I'd say to them and what I'd say to people pouring into my mentions, um, actually the usual, usual names and faces is, so you're saying that because of your left wing principles, people should wait longer. Is that it? So people should wait for months in pain and agony because your left wing principles are more important than getting people faster access to care. That's even a perfectly know, legitimate argument. But even the, though I we thought... know that people are paying to go faster because they can afford to, or they've scrimped and saved or even borrowed to go faster. That's not fair. That's not left wing. And, you know, what I'm fed up of is this absurd charge that somehow by using spare private sector capacity, Labour wants to privatise the NHS. I've been so clear about this. We'll privatise the NHS over my dead body. I believe in the NHS as a public service free at the point of use. Oh, yes. That's all perfectly well, fine. That's all, that's all perfectly fine and a perfectly legitimate argument. But I would put to you that maybe the people in your Twitter mentions are not especially relevant to anything. And using language like that, aping the kind of quite just culture war, politically aggressive language that the Conservatives have used, sound a bit like Suella Braverman. Is that what we can expect from a Keir Starmer-led Labour government? No, I think, that's a, I think that's an absurd comparison, to be honest. But look, the point is... I think you'd agree with it completely. The point is that we're, we're having a conversation about Labour's approach to reforming and modernising the NHS and cutting waiting lists because we've made punchy arguments that cut through. And sure, I could, I could, I could do some vanilla policy pamphlets... I've done some of those in my time. Um, I could make far more cosy and comfortable arguments that make people feel warm inside. And then we'll still be scratching our heads with people saying, oh, but you know, what are your policies? We, do, we don't hear them. So I make no apology whatsoever for making sure that Labour's policies and arguments are heard right across the breadth of the media, not just in the pages of newspapers that have been traditionally friendly to Labour. So I've got no problem at all with making those sorts of arguments to Sun readers, to Mail readers, to Express readers and newspapers that haven't recently supported the Labour Party. And also doing so in a way that um, that makes sure we've got debate, that makes sure we've got cut through. And yes, does take on some of those some of those. Uh, critics. And I'm not just talking about online activists, by the way, I'm talking about the absurd arguments you hear from some of the smaller parties as well. like Or, or your yes, own MPs, maybe. Greens. And, you know, I'm taking those arguments on. Let's talk about some of those harder arguments. Um, where are you on non-DOMs? We know that Rachel Reeves said she's going to tighten the government's own crackdown. Why not end the non-DOM status completely? And talking of Daily Mail readers, would you confront Jonathan Rothermere, a hereditary non-DOM, and say... We're going to crack down on the amount of pat tax that he pays or doesn't pay. Well, all non-DOMs will be caught up in these changes to the rules. And it's quite right to close off loopholes. And we're, we're not interested in sort of picking on individual taxpayers. No, but you That's have to. You actually have to, in a sense, because it's not, you know, non-DOMs aren't like 
NHS patients, there are only a limited number of people to whom this will matter who could. Yeah, and we're asking, and we're asking all of them to pay their fair share. So you're going to take this straight them. to the Daily Mail owner, Jonathan Rothermere, well, and well, say we, you we, could we, be caught in this. We already have, and I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, non doms, but Labour's already won the argument, and you know they can't even count on their friends or indeed their husbands in the Conservative Party to protect them any longer. What because was the, the response con- of Jonathan Rothermere? Just surrendered. Well, I, I'm, I'm, none, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not sure he's picked up the phone to. Kier or Rachel, certainly I'm far too low down the food chain. Um, but the, the point is, we'll, we'll, we'll take on these arguments and we'll win. There's a fundamental argument of fairness to be won here about the non-DOM tax, tax status. Labour's winning the argument. What we now want to do is to make sure we close those loopholes so we can invest in our NHS, cut waiting lists and get our NHS not just back on its feet, but fit for the future. On the uh, honey trap story, the Westminster honey trap story, Obviously convulsing Westminster in all sorts of ways, lots of MPs talking about it and political journalists as well. I mean, do you have any sympathy for William Ragg and what's happened to him? Mixed feelings, to be honest. I, I'm, I don't think he needs, uh, I probably suspect he doesn't need any, anyone else to tell him that he's been a complete idiot uh, and has let himself down, but also um, betrayed the trust of, of colleagues across Parliament and more broadly, because it seems like this this attempted sting has, has cast its net further than... Uh, MPs. Um, so look, he's a victim of this, and I have do have sympathy for him as a victim of a scam. But he has also behaved really irresponsibly and shown an appalling degree of judgment. And so, um, you know, I, I think you can hold two two of those thoughts simultaneously, yeah. which is I, I am angry actually um, at the way he's behaved, but I also do feel sorry for him on a human level because he is also a victim of a really awful sting and seems to have fallen for it a lot deeper than fortunately most people seem to have. I thought that interview actually summed up so much of where Labour is right now and the extent to which their poll lead is actually obscuring or insulating them from very difficult questions which are going to come when government arrives, when the NIF government arrives, in the sense that fundamentally right now, to answer that question that we started with, basically... The Conservative Party and the Labour Party, in economic terms, I actually can't remember a time when they've been closer. On all of the fundamental economic questions, there really is not that much difference between them. And in terms of what that means for a Labour government on tax and spend and so on, you've basically got a party which fundamentally in its bones believes that more money needs to be spent on every aspect of the public realm. And right now, and I don't think going up to and including the election, is actually going to have any means in the short to medium term of actually delivering it. Yeah, I think fundamentally what we're treating, what none of his colleagues can say out loud, is that they know how much they need to spend. Yes, they can talk about growth and the the need for growth and the hope for growth, really. And yes, they can talk about closing loopholes and appointing more tax commissioners. At some point, they will have to be cognizant of the pact that our public services are absolutely crying out for investment. It's the IFS, it's the Institute for Fiscal Studies that says, look at the kind of cuts to public services that are coming at you, even if nothing more is taken, right? It is going to be huge. And I think at some point, and it won't be until they get into government, I'm assuming, if they do, that they will be able to say that out loud. But it's staring everyone in the face right now. So it is Easter recess for MPs, and many of them choose to spend it in their constituencies. Many of them will use it to do some campaigning for the local elections, which are, of course, coming up on the 2nd of May. Some of them might even take a brief holiday. But not Suella Bravman, the former Home Secretary. She is using at least some of her Easter break to spend some time in Israel talking to Israeli government ministers, arguing that increasingly we're becoming too soft on Hamas, and insufficiently sympathetic to what Israel is going through. She was also on LBC this morning, talking to our colleague Nick Ferrari. This is their exchange about the terrible attacks on aid workers that we saw from Israel, which Israel has accepted responsibility for, which of course included the deaths of three British citizens. I very strongly rebut suggestions that uh, Israel's in breach of international law, that there's a a genocide, that there's a full starvation. Quite the contrary. Israel is doing a huge amount uh, using technology, sophisticated methods and a lot of care to minimise civilian casualties, uh, 
uh, to Brom, get aid into Monday, Gaza aid and to comply killed. with international Where law. Where was the precision and technology yes. last Monday? Listen, I was in Israel at the time of that tragic attack and I want to put on record my condolences to the families and friends of the killed aid workers. They were brave people putting the, their lives in danger in the aid of humanitarianism. But they should not have been killed. No, that's it was a mistake. Competence by the Israeli defence forces. It, it was a mistake, and the Israelis have been very quick. It is an extraordinary position, isn't it, for a former government minister to take, a former Home Secretary to take, the defence of the Israeli government in the face of the death of British citizens, and this whole idea that she has been there in a sense to make Israel's case, and I don't mean Israel the country in this case, I mean Israel the government, the Netanyahu government, and the actions they are taking to make that more forcefully to an audience back home who might be starting to ask more questions about arms sales to Israel or about the legality of their actions or about the morality of their actions in Gaza. And I guess she is not alone. She's speaking to a constituency here, maybe you know, broadly, slightly crudely, would say that the Telegraph reader audience of people who will continue to back whatever actions Israel is wanting to affect because they believe that Israel's fight in the Middle East is existential and they don't even believe the questions about sort of going too far should be raised. It is just odd that she is so at odds even with her own party on this right now, when you see the kind of moves that, for example, David Cameron and to some extent Rishi Sunak are now trying to make, this, this sense of where the, the full stop must come. I, I do think it's worth dwelling on that point about the uh, deaths, the three British citizens who lost their lives in that attack that the IDF has accepted responsibility for. It is amazing, I think, amazing, that Suella Braverman, who was Home Secretary until quite recently is in Israel and yes of course she's she's putting forth her condolences uh, and she is expressing her regret but for her to be in Israel and be in a position of defending the Israeli government or the Israeli military over it at a time when the British government her colleagues including David Cameron and the prime minister have been pretty excoriating actually about the Israeli action is is extraordinary and it is i think also a sign of the diminishing political authority of the government and Sunak personally, that she feels able to do that without any real indication of political pushback. To your point about Rishi Sunak's weakness, yes, this was Suella's chance to <laughs> give it both barrels, really, on where she thinks Sunak, the Prime Minister, is going wrong. And it's odd when Nick Ferrari, our colleague, asks her about the sort of imminent general election, there is a an almost sort of gleeful response from her about how terrible she thinks it's going to be. Just have a listen. The honest truth is that we are heading for a defeat, to put it mildly, at the general election. I very much uh, hope that we change course and that we improve uh, the offer to the British people. Uh, ultimately, uh, measures on tax cuts, measures on migration, measures on national security and social cohesion and extremism are insufficient by this government. We need to go further. We need to demonstrate to the British people that we're on their side. Would you put yourself forward to be leader of the Conservative Party? Listen, I'm not thinking about any kind of leadership campaign. There is a, The Prime Minister Truthfully? is in place... Absolutely. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak is our Prime Minister. I fully expect him to lead us into the next general election. You've just given a passionate election. defence of the Conservatives, a passionate cry why you don't believe in a Labour government. If the polls are to be believed, you might be looking at 150 Conservatives just left. They'll be desperately looking for a leader. Surely that's when, if you believe with the passion you've just displayed, that's when you step forward, Mrs Bravman. I am very passionate about serving my country. I'm doing my job. I've been elected by the good people of Fareham to be a spokesman for them, to stand up for British values, to fight Labour and to ensure that we control our borders, make the best of Brexit, uh, ensure that we are the party of law and order. That our... Even here in that clip, this is where Israel and her position on Israel and her leadership ambitions, which are, of course, undoubtedly present, fuse. Because when we're talking about that split between the sort of pragmatists and the kind of more ideologically committed conservatives to, to Israel, that is exactly what Braverman represents and to whom she is appealing by being there. There is 
something which has developed not just in the Conservative Party in Britain, but it's happened in the Republican Party in the US over the past you know, three, four decades, which is this, it has almost become part of the litmus test of being a true Conservative as to how committed to Israel you are and the Israeli project, the Zionist project you are. And again, that is the division between someone like Braverman and someone like Cameron, who represents, as I say, an older school of thought within the Conservative Party, which is more pragmatic, less ideologically committed to affairs in the Middle East. And there is no question at all that she has in mind at the moment something which has been happening in Westminster more and more, there's more and more chatter of in Westminster more and more, which is, of course, a rival to the Conservative right or to the leadership of the Conservative right, which is, in fact, one of her predecessors as Home Secretary, Priti Patel, who has been playing a far more subtle game Mm. under the radar in recent weeks and months. She hasn't been going around criticising Sunak, but, of course, she didn't turn against Truss. She didn't turn against Johnson. And more and more, listeners may have a sort of believe it or not moment with this, but she's being talked about as a potential unity candidate for the Conservative Party in the event that Sunak were to go, resign, be pushed, whatever. It, meanwhile, you've got Braverman, who is a far more divisive figure, continuing to make noise in arenas such as this. And she is obviously feeling that she must do so, partly to try and stay relevant and to get political oxygen and to try and squeeze Patel out. But I think that is some of the sort of subterranean kind of movements that are going on within the Conservative Party at the moment. And one man who's taken himself right out of it and who has spent the last night uh, in the glitzy ballroom of Mar-a-Lago, which I now feel I know so well, um, is David Cameron. <laughs> you've got, a, you've got an annual pass. <laughs> I've got yeah. a little window yeah. um, into the, the chandelier-like um, arena that he he has been in with Donald Trump. Now, I don't think this is that unusual. I mean, eyebrows have been raised about why you'd go and see a Republican um, candidate. He's rather gone to see than, him overnight. He's gone to see him yes. overnight. He's gone to chat to him about Ukraine funding. And I think, again, going back to that pragmatism, he realises that Trump is the key, frankly, to unlocking money from America's right, or from Congress, essentially, to give to aid to Ukraine. And he has said things about him in the past that might have made that first meeting quite uncomfortable. This is David Cameron talking about what loosely became known as Trump's Muslim ban. I think his remarks are divisive, stupid and wrong. And I think if he came to visit our country, I think he'd unite us all against him. I mean, weirdly, he did. Do you remember that huge Trump balloon that sort of floated above the crowds in sort of, you know, Oxford yeah. Street. I mean, it was an extraordinary... It was Trump in nappies. Do you remember? It was when he... Yeah. The day before he was actually meeting the Queen, everyone was out on the streets looking at this Trump balloon. You know what's amazing about listening to that Cameron clip there? It it, it really does feel like a sort of time capsule from another age. Mm. In a sense, it was it was in the year 2016. It was pre-Brexit. Just, just pre-Brexit. Or pre-Brexit referendum vote, anyway. And obviously pre the November election where Trump was elected. And it just speaks, I think... There's, there's no way that a British Prime Minister or British political leader, leader of opposition, Starmer or whatever, would say something like that now. Even though most of them dislike Trump, they dislike his politics, they... They don't uh, think they were wrong to say it in the first no, place. No, no one actually, like, I'm sure Starmer, soon like the rest of them would, would listen to that and not, you know, there may be some figures like Braverman or whatever, who or, or Truss, who are more sympathetic, but most of these figures would basically have gone along with what Cameron said in 2016 and probably still privately think it. But right now, the idea of any major Western, let alone British, political leader saying that or anything close to that about Trump just shows us, reminds us how far we've travelled. How far the world has travelled. And and to be fair, one of the points that Cameron has made to Trump was about defence spending. And you can see how, and I guess this is, you know, if we're being fair, the genius of Trump is that there is 98% absolutely random, crazy, thought bubble, weird shit going on and then he nails something absolutely and in this case it was about NATO defence spending and and whether countries were actually putting in their weight you know sticking to what they promised in terms of their own defence budgets rather than relying on America and Cameron has gone to make the case to Trump that he gets it you know he gets it on behalf of Europe and I suppose that is a you know a check to Trump right but it feels like I mean oh to be a fly on that wall I mean (laughs) to be a fly on that glitzy star-ridden wall because I mean it's not going to be shabby chic no it's not it's not going to be Soho Farmhouse it is not I mean honestly Lord Cameron of Chipping Norton heading in to the 
to the glassy ballrooms of, of Mar-a-Lago. I mean, I mean, the floors squeak when you walk. Yeah, well, quite. It's like kind of garnered out of water, you know, like even Truss, who has obviously had this Damascene conversion, so-called, to kind of so many of the kind of tenets of Trumpism and, and populism. They still think that she's basically deep state, right? They still don't really trust yeah. someone like yeah. her. Cameron, like, could not better epitomise any of it for them in their eyes. So the idea, even leaving aside stuff that he said about him in the in the past, I think it was 2015, not 2016 when he said that, actually. But the idea that this is the guy who is going to be the messenger and this me- this message is going to be received. I mean, even before Marjorie, dear Marjorie, had those you know, choice words for you, Emily. She also had choice words for Cameron as well, right? She told Tim yeah, that, well, so kiss my ass. Yeah, she does. Um, such, a, such a way with words. <laughs> she does. She really does. She nails got English that. language. She nails yeah. it. But I think they'll, they'll also be flattered by Cameron because there is the sort of, you know, the, the you American like his perception. Sort of noblesse, of the sort of Hugh Grantiness yeah. of somebody who has been Prime Minister, who still speaks in, in quite a posh voice, yes. coming to pay lip service to a man who is not in power. Well, Trump likes central president. casting, right? He likes everyone he to look the like part. they would in a film. Yeah. Like, that's why he likes his generals, because yeah. he was like, my generals look so great. And, honestly, and I suppose Cameron looks the part. It's exactly yeah. what you would expect a British Foreign Secretary, for good or ill, to look like and to sound like. And I keep coming back to this thought that the one person who would really like Rishi Sunak to delay the general election to the very latest date, to, you know, the 25th of January. It's not the Californian realtors, is it? It's not. It's it's David Cameron, who is having a ball. You know, doing actually quite a good job as Foreign Secretary, getting it, travelling a lot. I think he snuck in the Falklands at one point. I think he's having yeah. a ball in this new role and probably Especially, just wants it to last forever. It's right? a massive travel agents this year, isn't it, really, for Cameron, the Foreign Office? No, I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I suspect, I've always thought that when he took the job, he probably got an undertaking from Sunak that it, it was going to be for... I wonder... I, I yeah, always assume I because why would you Eight do it months? for three months? Yeah, I'm not doing it for two months. You yeah. can't get you can't travel to the Turks and Caicos Islands in the first three months, right? You've got to do that in sort of October or <laughs> November. Got to do the Middle East. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Andaman Islands, all yeah. this sort of stuff. So Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got to tick those off. So I mean, I've always assumed that, but yeah, he's. Um, but it, it goes back to that thing that we were just discussing in a in a in a political world where I can't remember the foreign secretary occupying such a big place in daily. British political discourse for quite a long time. And I, that is partly because it's Cameron, but it's also partly because Sunak is clearly largely uninterested. And so it's created this huge space for Cameron to do what foreign secretaries always want to do and almost never get to do because most prime ministers love the foreign stuff, right? Yeah. That's the fun stuff. Yeah. And actually conduct their own foreign policy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's sort of... Exactly. In so many ways, Cameron is a sort of slightly 19th century figure and he's basically like Lord Castlereagh right now, getting to do whatever he wants around the world. Well, in a few days' time, We will be getting to see, perhaps even read, the new memoir of Liz Truss. And in it, she recounts the advice she was given by the Queen, the late Queen, 96-year-old Queen Elizabeth, just days before she died in September 2022. And Truss confirms the Queen told her in that meeting at Balmoral to pace herself, advice that Liz Truss famously ignored it is extraordinary isn't it i mean i mean it, it perhaps speaks to how um wise and how how much she picked up at been having it's done so it little time for so well yeah but also having had so many prime ministers yeah. over so many years i mean people always talked about and prime ministers always talked about her kind of sagacity and her kind of wisdom and her the fact that she'd seen it all before but if that is true, if that is true, her basic last observation, political observation. Her last offering was to try and save the state from what we in <laughs> fact went through. Right. It's extraordinary. She was a wise old bird. We asked, uh, we, we're streeting about it. That was our last question. We promised you. This is what he said about it. I think it's fair to say um, he had some he had some thoughts. I literally couldn't care less about what Liz Trust has to say about this or anything else. I think the fact she still shows her face shows she is utterly shameless. What she did in her short tenure as Prime Minister was utterly catastrophic for this country. And yet she marauds around the world, flaunting a book, uh, publish, publishing her, publicising her own kind of warped ideology and views as if nothing has happened. I think it is utterly shameless what she's done. And, you know, it's a pretty crowded field, isn't it, the last 14 years, which is the worst Conservative Prime Minister we've had. It's been a crowded and competitive field. But I cannot understand how she continues to parade around 
as if she's done nothing wrong. Uh, and look, finally, I, I think there's just a general rule in politics. You don't betray um, the confidence of what's said to you as prime minister when the monarch. So not only is she utterly shameless, she's also a shameless self-publicist too. West Street and sitting on the fence there. <laughs> uh, One day he'll tell us what he really thinks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've talked about it on the show before, but uh, actually the thing is, as as completely irritating as it is, and I completely understand that trust i think is playing things quite well in terms of her own particular Brand. needs yeah and not with the public i mean she knows i mean she must know if she has any self-awareness at all which is an if that you know in terms of public perception and whatever the case is lost but in the small right-wing world political ecosystem which exists transatlantic but especially in this country actually she is rehabilitating herself. And there's plenty of money to be made. And there's there. plenty of money to be made. And the number of times, her, her her primary objective has been to create the narrative that she is a martyr to conservatism. I think that she will be a more influential force on conservatism in this country in the next five years, certainly than Rishi Sunak, and certainly than most people would like. Look, we're living in a world where you write your own narrative. Totally. And if your narrative is that the courts are against you and it's a witch hunt or that the democratic system is against you and it's a witch hunt or that the, who was it, the deep state got rid of you and it's a witch hunt, if you sell that hard enough and often enough that you are the victim, you will find plenty of people happy to come and follow your coattails. And pay you money. And pay you money. We're back tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast.